Good morning and a warm welcome to Seaview Presbyterian Church as we gather for worship. In Psalm 19, we read, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech, night after night they reveal knowledge. Let us worship God. Let us pray. Father, thank you for creating us, for the life you have given us. We know in the very breath we take your love towards us. Your creation speaks of your love for all that you have made, and we praise you, God, for all of it. Father, we have desired many things in life, to have power, to gain wealth, to be high in the estimation of others. Desiring many things, we have not desired enough those things which make for life and peace, your presence, your word, and to seek your kingdom. Forgive us our sins, in Jesus' name. Amen. Our reading today comes from Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 29 and reading through to chapter 23 and verse 8. Let us hear God's word. Do you see a man skilled in his work? He will serve before kings. He will not serve before obscure men. When you sit to dine with a ruler, note well what is before you, and put a knife to your throat if you are given to gluttony. Do not crave his delicacies, for that food is deceptive. Do not wear yourself out to get rich. Have the wisdom to show restraint. Cast but a glance at riches and they are gone, for they will surely sprout wings and fly off to the sky like an eagle. Do not eat the food of a stingy man. Do not crave his delicacies, for he is the kind of man who is always thinking about the cost. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. You will vomit up the little you have eaten, 
and you have wasted your compliments. Amen. May God bless this reading of his word to our hearts and minds. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the things you have given us to do in life, things we may learn, skills we may practice. We thank you for our daily duties, for our family, friends, and the fellowship we have in Christ. Father, teach us to appreciate the good in life more fully and to trust you for our needs. For you have been so gracious to us and surrounded us with grace in Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. Help us, Lord, to trust in him and to receive all your good gifts with thanksgiving. We pray for those bereaved and feeling lo loneliness and loss. Lord, of comfort, strengthen them with eternal faith and draw them into life and friendship and peace once more. Heal the body, mind and spirit of those who struggle with illness. Encourage those who fear or doubt and help us, Lord, in all our struggles. Give us our daily bread and bless our efforts to bring justice and to help those in need. We pray for help and guidance to our leaders in the church and in society. And we ask, Lord, that you would work out your will and your great purpose in and through us. And may in all things your will be done. Amen. Well, we have been reading in Proverbs, and we've be, uh, come to the 30 sayings in Proverbs, which uh, speak about how we reach out into life to influence it for God and for wisdom, and give us some insight in how to do that. We've looked at the first four of the 30 sayings, and today we're going to look at sayings 5, 6, 7, and 8. As we come to these, they are teaching us what righteousness looks like, and they are also helping us uh, to think about life and how to reach out into it, to influence the world for wisdom and for God. And in these, there is uh, something of a sense of humor, as we'll see as we go through. Uh, saying five tells us that it is skill that influences. Do something and do it well. Get better at it. Focus on skill and on quality. Do the good thing for its own sake, and you will draw the attention of uh, those who are powerful. And these sayings all relate, in a way, to how we influence, how we get a proper influence, a godly influence in the world. There are things, however, which war with our souls. In 1 Peter 2 and verse 11, Peter writes of this. He says, Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Desire for power, for wealth, and for popularity are such things. They war against our souls even as we desire them. Instead of being free and relaxed and full of love to God, we get drawn into wanting power or wealth or popularity in other people's eyes. And these very desires rob us of our peace, our joy, and our simple trust in God. They war against our souls. Not only are they bad for us, they are poor ways to influence the world, as Proverbs shows us here. For everyone else is seeking these things too. The powerful person who invites you to dine has an agenda. Wealth is a thing which comes around by going around, and so you will lose it as fast as you gain it. And suddenly, all of your life is the treadmill running to stand still, trying to gain wealth, to spend it again, to gain wealth, to spend it again. 
in the picture in Proverbs of how wealth, if you look at it, is like a bird that suddenly flies off. Uh, the moment you move towards it is uh, a lovely picture of what wealth is like. For we build it up and we spend it. It's there to be used. It comes around by going around. It is ephemeral, not there forever. Popularity, respect, position in the eyes of others, well, that might actually be the most destructive thing to seek at all. Think of what it actually is. It is a desire to be weighed in the eyes of others, to have your value given to you by others. It is to dine in the home of a stingy man. He will assess and weigh you all right, and whatever he says to your face, he will tell others exactly what you are worth. Don't look for your estimation in the eyes of others. We are, all of us, sinners. Instead, if we want to influence the world for God and for wisdom, be as skilled at what we do as we are able. It doesn't, in a sense, matter what the work is, whether we are serving at tables or being a parent or keeping our own home, or running a company, or working in one, a desk job, or outdoor, to minister, or to pray, to learn, or to teach. The point is summed up in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 31. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Pay attention to what you do and do it, for its own sake. The righteous life is then interested in the work and the craft and the skill for its own sake. Isn't it strange then that it is not the best way to influence the world to actually try to influence the world? It is not the best way to influence the world to try for popularity or to try for wealth or to try for power. The best way to influence the world is to walk with God and have that audience of one that the earlier part of Proverbs revealed to us, to just have him as our audience. Wisdom begins with a deep reverence for God. And this reverent knowledge of God changes our view of life and gives us a different view of it. Since life is his gift to you, since your life is his gift to you, you live it to him, you live it with him. You also know that other people's lives are his gift to them. They are to live it to him, with him. So you seek no power over others. Why would you? You do not expect them to rate you at all. Why would you? And if they did, what would it count with you? You have an audience of one. You can use wealth, but you wouldn't chase it. Why would you? What use is more wealth than you can use in living the life God gifted to you. Instead, other things matter. Almost all of them, well, maybe all of them, have to do with quality. The quality of your relationship with God matters. The quality of how you conduct your relationships with others matters. And joy The quality of joy in life matters. In other words, if we have an audience of one, of God himself, if we live our lives to him, we don't get caught up in the treadmill of life. We have to work. We want to do it with skill to the best of our ability. We certainly want to do things for the Lord and and with him in the world. 
But the things which really matter to us are things like this. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I am painting a picture of righteousness from the Proverbs. I do not claim that I have attained all this, but this I do, I press on to take hold of that for which my strong Saviour took hold of me, and so must you. Now I want to pause there. I want you to think and consider what we have been saying. The the Proverbs before us today are plain enough in their meaning. Be skilled. Be careful of powerful people playing you. Desist from always wanting more. Know when to stop. And realise that some count everything that they give you against you. Well, those Proverbs speak powerfully and simply enough. But I want you to take them in more deeply and especially in relation to what we know the Proverbs is really teaching us about righteousness and about what righteousness is and what it really looks like. And I want you to take it in 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 terms of what Christ has done for us because as Christians, we know that we can't attain righteousness. I said to you... I. And I was quoting from Paul, not that I have already attained all this, but I strive to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. And that's what we do as Christians. We aren't, we are not able to save ourselves. We must be saved. We only strive to take hold of that for which Christ and his great strength took hold of us. So as I think of these three sayings, I am reminded of Peter, the Lord's disciple. I'm reminded of how before the Lord's Supper, Peter stood up and and declared that even if everyone else ran away, he would never run away. How at the Lord's Supper, along with all the other disciples, when Jesus said someone would betray him, uh, Peter with all the others said, no, it, it wouldn't be me, surely not me. Peter had some confidence still in himself and in his own ability. You know, these three sayings relating to wealth and to popularity and relating also um, uh, to seeking power, these are, these are things people crave and want partly because of how it, it makes them feel about themselves that if they could gain power or they could gain wealth or they could gain popularity that somehow they would have that reflected. We'd, we'd know our value. And Proverbs says, not only will they not give you value, they are valueless. The power that you think you're gaining with the powerful, or even if you become the powerful, it's all just agendas. The wealth that you gain, well, what are you going to use it for? And when you use it, it's gone. And anyway, it's ephemeral, it passes away. And popularity, well, how destructive is that for a way to live and and want to live your life, to seek always the approval of others rather than having an audience of God alone? The thing is, like Peter, we're going to fail. And the Lord knows what we are like. He knew what Peter was like. And so he said to Peter, Peter, before, before the morning comes and the cock crows three times, you will have denied me three times. And Peter, 
did fail just as his master knew he would. He went to uh, follow Jesus to his trial and went into the courtyard. And three times he denied having ever known Jesus at all. And we're told that two things happen. One is Jesus is being led out away from his trial and he looks at Peter as Peter looks at him. And the cock crows. And Peter remembers what Jesus said to him. And he goes off in tears. Peter had just learned what Jesus always knew. Peter had just learned what Jesus always knew. That Peter was a sinner. That Peter wasn't strong. That Peter wasn't a powerful person. Or able to maintain his own popularity. He certainly wasn't a man of wealth. Jesus knew that far from being powerful and righteous and and a hero of the age, Peter was just a sinner who when put to the test would deny and deny and deny ever having had anything to do with Jesus. I realize this, Jesus knew that. Jesus knew that. That didn't stop him loving Peter. That didn't stop him calling Peter. That didn't stop him saving Peter. So understand this. You cannot save yourself. These proverbs that teach us wisdom, that show us what righteousness is like, knowing them doesn't make you righteous. We only strive to take hold of that for which our strong Saviour has taken hold of us. You have to let him save you. You must let Jesus save you. You are weak. So am I. We are sinners. We need to be rescued. We need to be saved. And that is why he came. That is why he came. When Jesus worked upon Peter for many years, long after the crucifixion and the resurrection and sending his Holy Spirit to Peter and to the others, Peter would stand at the end for Christ. But Peter had to be transformed and changed by Jesus. So as we read these proverbs, these warnings against seeking wealth or power or popularity, as we read these proverbs that tell us to simply love the good deed for the good deed's own sake, to have an audience of one, to to play to God, to give our lives in in simplicity, whatever we have to him in love, and, and do it well, and then he will influence the world. He will draw the powerful. As we learn these things, learn what the outset of these 30 sayings told us. These 30 sayings, the proverb said, I have written for you so that your trust will be in God. Because I don't want you to go away thinking from this set of proverbs that you have to, you have to, you have to. I want you to let Jesus save you. And simply let these proverbs guide you in life so that you can strive to take hold of that for which your Saviour has taken hold of you. Let, let the Proverbs show you righteousness. Don't go chasing wealth and popularity 
or power, position in the world. Don't go chasing those things for those things' sake. They are ephemeral. They disappear. They, they are nothing. They are valueless. Have an audience of one. And seek to do the good deed for the good deed's own sake. The good skilled thing for the skill's own sake. And then these things will not war with your soul. You're ready to let go of the things which all this time have warred with your soul. Let go of chasing power or wealth or popularity. Take an audience of one your strong saviour who has taken hold of you. Let us pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, you know that we are sinners and therefore we ask for your forgiveness in Jesus Christ for all the times when we have sought power or wealth or popularity or worse, imagine that we had it and that that gave us our worth. Lord, help us to be so in love with you that we let you save us. Help us, Lord, to do the good thing for the good thing's own sake and to look to you as we live. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.